In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. I have an article here from uh, Fox News concerning all that uh, mess down in New Orleans. And it starts off saying, uh, Violence and chaos disrupted the evacuation efforts in New Orleans Thursday as thousands of National Guard troops poured into the Crescent City to boost security in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. It goes on to talk about how corpses are laying around everywhere and uh, they can't get people any food or water or medicine. And uh, then uh, a Reverend Isaac Clark said, We are out here like pure animals. Uh, We don't have help. And then it goes on. uh, I'll skip some of this uh, and get uh, to the point. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Part of it has to do with chaos at the Superdome. And this article doesn't mention it, but uh, when the uh, sun goes down, then all the uh, lawless people come out and they are raping people in the Superdome, in the bathrooms, which are over flooded with uh, sewer and all that, sewage. And, uh, well, people are starting to act like animals. And, uh, in fact, I won't read the article, I know what happened today, Uh, a lot of boats were parked on the shore of I-10, and they were trying to uh, get supplies down to help those who need it very badly, and they started shooting at them as they were coming in. So they halted all of that, and then the, the military was airlifting some sick people out of a hospital, they started shooting at the, uh, helicopter. Uh, What this indicates is lack of humility. And in fact, there's been such a disintegration of the family that uh, when disaster hits, people act like animals instead of uh, having some humility. And that's our subject. And it's also a sign of the times and the fact that our country is in serious, serious trouble. And uh, it's just a sign of it. And uh, we may continue for 20, 30 more years, maybe even longer, but... uh, We're definitely in a state of decline. And um, a lot of it is related to the fact that there are uh, millions and millions of vessels of dishonor around the country. And that is how the Bible describes them. Vessels of dishonor because they do not respect authority. They don't respect the authority of their parents. They don't respect the authority of the police officer. They don't respect the authority of the military. So therefore, uh, they start to bite the hand that's about to feed them as they're doing as some, not all of them, of course. There's a, a criminal element that's doing this. Uh, but this criminal element uh, definitely has to be taken care of. And in fact, what we should have down there is a large military presence in which uh, when this looting and this uh, st- raping and all of these terrible things go on, they should just shoot them right there and kill them. It would stop in a hurry. And uh, that's uh, how the government could enforce some humility. Uh, but we have some... Uh, problems uh, with doing that. You know what the media would say if they start shooting people. uh, They would jump all over the president and everybody else. But that's what needs to be done. But it's not going to be done. So people are going to live in chaos and misery there for a while to come. And so we have uh, some verses from Proverbs dealing with humility and also the antithesis of humility, which is arrogance. When arrogance comes, this Excuse me, this is Proverbs 11.2. When arrogance comes, then comes dishonor. But with the humble is wisdom. The only way to live a life of wisdom is to have humility. Humility is, first of all, a mental attitude that is directed towards self. And you must have it yourself. Also, it's a mental attitude directed toward other people. One aspect of humility directed toward others is to have, uh, it's not uh, really compassion per se, but it's to have um, appreciation or uh, consideration, that's the word, it's to have consideration for others. 
and when you're on the highway, you have consideration when you use your blinker, and you have consideration when you uh, uh, help people out instead of just uh, have a road rage. Uh, but what ha what's happening in New Orleans is there's there's no consideration for others. Uh, just a uh, uh, shooting, ever, just shooting at will, ad hominem, anything that they see, and uh, acting like uh, animals, at which that is what they're acting like, and uh, it's a it's a real tragedy, and it shows the fact that um, when disaster really does hit this country, especially in certain areas of the country. Uh, people don't know how to handle it, and that's because of lack of humility and consideration toward others. If everybody would just uh, relax, put their faith in the Lord, and have consideration for each other, they could get through this much easier with a lot less uh, loss of life and uh, a lot less misery. And uh, they've been without food for four days, and some of them are very thirsty, and that can be agitating. Uh, but uh, it's no reason to lose your consideration. And that means they've lost their humility. It means they've never had any. So humility is the means by which the protocol plan of God is executed. Without humility, we cannot live this unique spiritual life. It would be a totally impossible. The first act of humility in the Christian way of life is to name our sins to God. If you're not humble, you're not going to do that. You're going to justify yourself and you're going to have self-deception and self-absorption, all of which keep you outside of fellowship and outside of the protocol plan of God. So humility is necessary for execution of the protocol plan of God. And when you come into Bible class and sit down and make Bible doctrine number one in your life, that's also an act of humility. And it's uh, placing... Um, uh, Jesus Christ as the authority, and Jesus Christ as the authority, it is His mandate that we grow in grace and in knowledge, and it's a daily thing, and not every once in a while. Psalms 25, 8 uh, through 9 uh, tells us that humility is teachability. Good and honorable is the Lord. That's Psalms 25, 8 through 9. Good and honorable is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in the way. Injustice, that is, divine integrity, the point of reference. Injustice, he guides the humble. Consequently, he teaches the humble his way. That is his plan, his purpose. And his plan for us is the protocol plan of God, which is derived from our Lord's prototype spiritual life that he lived on the earth. Without teachability, there is no humility. If you are not humble, you're not teachable. And a lot of people are not teachable whatsoever, and they can have an IQ of 172 and be geniuses and completely unteachable. And that's why there are some geniuses in prison today. Geniuses, smart people who had a lot of potential, but because of no humility, uh, then uh, actually they're stupid. And IQ, unless... Uh, the, no matter how great your IQ is, unless you possess humility, it's going to take you nowhere. Uh, an arrogant person with a high IQ can be very stupid or very ignorant because of lack of teachability. And it takes humility to be teachable. And uh, as I said, that's why there are some genius criminals uh, behind bars today. And humility is the only thing that will keep a person with a high IQ uh, as teachable. The only thing, because uh, they have a tendency in their, with their high IQ sometimes to become arrogant with it. And uh, once that occurs, they lose their teachability. Teachability, therefore, recognizes uh, two things, and now we're talking about in the unique spiritual life. Teachability recognizes two things. The authority of the teacher and the authority of the content of the message. Hence, uh, they recognize the authority of the Word of God as the thinking of Christ. And, of course, the Word of God must be communicated. Uh, you can't let the, the Word of God speak for itself. Uh, you have to have a communicator. And you can't just uh, read your Bible and learn it. You have to have somebody who can teach it. And it takes humility to listen to a teacher. It takes humility to accept the content of the message. And it takes a humility to accept the authority of the Word of God. For example, uh, you wives, it takes humility when you uh, read in Ephesians and in uh, 1 Peter that you must obey your husband. It takes humility to accept that, to accept the authority of the Word of God. 
Humility is the, and this is a point to be taken down, humility is the sum total of grace orientation. Humility is the sum total of grace orientation. If you have grace orientation, uh, you uh, re- resulting from that, you'll have humility. Actually, humility is what starts it, and resulting from humility, you will eventuate in having grace orientation. And grace orientation is very important for any church because uh, those people um, live and let live. And uh, people's sins are not brought out into public viewing so that uh, people can make fun of someone else because of their uh, problems in their area of the sin nature. We all have sin natures. And yet in most churches they want to uh, parade everybody's sin in front of each other. That's not grace orientation and that is not humility in any way, shape, or form. And most churches around here today are filled with arrogance, complete arrogance. And uh, a lot of people said the hurricane hit New Orleans because it's sin city. Every city's a sin city. Everybody has sin natures. That's not why. It's not because of sin. It's because of a, a lack of a doctrine. And it is the knowledge of the Word and uh, having doctrine that uh, provides uh, stability for the nation and provides blessing for the nation. And New Orleans was not hit hit because of it, it, it's uh, tantamount to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not. It wasn't even close to Sodom and Gomorrah. And it has nothing to do with sin. It has to do with the fact that this nation has uh, the Christians in this nation have lost their impact. The, the the invisible heroes have become too few, and so the levy system uh, for holding back divine discipline has broken. And more divine discipline will come just like floodwaters. This is one area of it, and one area got hit harder than others, but we're all feeling the effects of it, and all of us are going to have less money to work with, and we're going to have to cut back on certain things that we might like to do, and therefore uh, it's going to be a test for those who are growing in grace, and it's punishment for those uh, those Christians who haven't gotten with the Word of God. And they might, uh, so a lot of these Christians might uh, hold up their nose today and say, uh, that place deserved it. That place got it because they have failed in the Christian way of life. And our whole country's suffering, and it's going to continue this way until there's a turnaround. And if there's not a turnaround, then we're going to see uh, more of this stuff. Maybe not natural disasters, but maybe terrorist strikes. Something else, a more disaster. And I can tell you, I have not seen as much disaster uh, come to this nation in my lifetime, though it's been short, uh, but um, in many years. I mean, this is one of the most powerful storms that has hit the country since the 1900 uh, or 1906, I believe, the Galveston storm, which killed uh, about, uh, they estimate, 12,000 people and also wiped out the richest city in America, which was Galveston. And uh, now it's poor, and it's nothing like it used to be. It was wiped out, devastated, destroyed. In the same manner New Orleans has been in modern times. And also, we can't forget, 9-11 happened just a few, uh, well, was it four years ago? Coming up this September. Four years ago. Now, that might seem like uh, ages ago, but it's just like yesterday to me. And uh, now uh, we've had, uh, we're going to keep having disaster after disaster to, to wake people up and to get them to have humility. Right now they are filled with arrogance and the only way to bring about humility right now is to enforce it by God's almighty hand and He will and uh, if we don't turn around then seven times worse than this will come as we've studied in the five cycles of discipline. Now grace orientation occurs in three categories. Now there's three categories to grace orientation. There are three categories that you need to understand fully before you can have a grace orientation. First of all, there is pre-salvation grace. Pre-salvation grace. Now, pre-salvation grace is composed of common and efficacious grace. And we went over that some yesterday, of the fact that in common grace, the unbeliever is... Uh, helped by God the Holy Spirit to understand the gospel since the unbeliever is spiritually dead. And then in efficacious grace, 
uh, God the Holy Spirit makes faith alone and Christ alone efficacious. So to have grace orientation, we must understand that, and uh, all of us here probably do today. We went over it enough. Now, the second thing is salvation grace through faith in Christ. Salvation grace through faith in Christ. That's actually resultant of efficacious grace. And then the third thing is post-salvation grace. The second one again, salvation grace through faith in Christ. The third one, post-salvation grace. And what is post-salvation grace? Well, for every believer, it's logistical grace, winner or loser. And there are uh, uh, maybe 97, 98, 99% of uh, born-again believers who are losers and who don't care for the spiritual life, and yet they still receive logistical grace support. Well, that's post-salvation grace, and they're kept alive for a reason, so that uh, maybe they'll wake up to the importance of the Word of God. Now, humility responds to truth, and there are different kinds of truth. Humility responds to truth. Arrogance always responds to the lie, and that's where we get strong delusion. And a lot of people uh, have become so arrogant that they will simply uh, suck up a lie. I have been almost, uh, uh, it's not shocking, it should mortify me, but it doesn't, but I've been almost uh, mortified by some comments that have been made in which they try to politicize what has happened. And and not just a few people say it, it's a a whole groundswell of a different uh, political party than I'm affiliated with, and they blame the hurricane on George Bush, as if uh, his face is on the little hurricane that's spinning around and coming up. I mean, it's insane. Well, that's a lie, of course, but they're willing to accept it from arrogance, and I guess they have to put blame on somebody, so blame the president as if he has any control over weather or anything else. They try, they think, they think mankind does because of global warming. Well, the globe is warming, but the globe has cooled in the past as well, and it's not man-made. They must think so highly of themselves. This is arrogance, and it's a lie. Uh, Yes, there might be. It's not even proven yet, but there might be global warming. But it would be a natural cycle. There was a time when England was frozen not too long ago. Uh, A lot of all their lakes were frozen. They got a lot of snow, and that was uh, just back in the 1600s. Now it's not. And uh, uh, there was an ice age, and there have been phases of warming and cooling. And, and, and this, uh, all these hurricanes and all this weather phenomenon is not really caused by global warming. It's a cycle. In the early 1900s, we had lots of hurricanes. Then we had a lull from about 1965 through uh, about 1990-something, and then they started coming back. It's a cycle. Weather has cycles, and uh, it, the arrogance of people to think that they can control the weather or that they can heat this earth. When a volcano explodes, it forces out uh, more pollutants than mankind has ever created with the automobile, ever created. One volcanic explosion, and we've had several. So the thinking is arrogance, it's false science, pseudoscience, all based on arrogance. It's satanic, and it is an attempt to uh, destroy capitalism. And in some aspects, it has succeeded. You want to know really why gas prices are so high? Because no refineries have been built since 1972 because environmentalists said, no, you can't do that. Oil causes global warming. And there was a time in the 70s when they were all worried about global cooling. And remember in the 80s, we had some very cold years right down here in the south. I don't know. I know in Spartanburg we had uh, two back-to-back snowstorms that were uh, record breakers, about 14 inches of snow each, and two years in a row. And we had a, a very snow, very cold. Remember when the Challenger exploded? It's because uh, Florida had frozen, and so did the Challenger, and that's why it uh, blew up. They shouldn't have t- taken off under such harsh conditions. Uh, But uh, then they were talking about global cooling. Now it's global warming. All of it is uh, thinking man can change it, though. All of it uh, has to do with arrogance. Now, the mandate for humility is found in Proverbs 3, 33 through 35. The mandate for humility is found in Proverbs 3, 33 through 35. 
The curse of the Lord is on the house of evil, but He blesses the home of the righteous. He makes war against the arrogant, but He gives grace to the humble. The wise person will inherit honor, but fools carry away dishonor. I couldn't help but think about the looters when I uh, read this about fools carry away dishonor. That's what they were doing when they were carrying away those supplies, as if they were going to do anything with them anyway. A lot of them will probably just stay there and die. And uh, some of them will get out, of course, but a lot of these criminals won't. They'll just wreak may, uh, have a lot of mayhem until they die because they're not going to get any food acting like that. And they carry away dishonor. Now, this, uh, now, the house of evil refers to a family that is living under the cosmic system. And in this case, it means they neither have enforced humility or genuine humility. And a house, a house of evil would be a house that teaches their children that the police officer is evil and uh, uh, you must rebel against the police officer. And there are families like this. There are families that say you must rebel against your teachers. And the whole family's rebellious from top to bottom. And it's a house of evil. And they have these. And that's why police officers are having such a hard time now in New Orleans because they're dealing with a lot of houses of evil that have sprung up. And uh, now that they're not getting there in, some, in many cases, and I don't say this racially, there's welfare to everyone, but uh, the welfare case, a lot of those people are uh, poverty-stricken. Louis, uh, New Orleans has been known for its uh, social welfare system, and they've uh, passed out, uh, as it were, government cheese to uh, uh, the, the greater populace of New Orleans. And I don't say this to be racial, white people get on welfare, and, and in some cases welfare is uh, definitely needed to get somebody back on their feet. Uh, but... Um, their system is one of dependence. I mean, uh, I think our system in South Carolina, you can be on it two years, but you better get a job. Well, I can understand that system, but one that just keeps you on welfare and government dependent that long, well, when a disaster hits, they're going to blame the government because they don't get their money anymore and their houses of evil, so they're going to come out and have violence. Now, it is a family, the house of evil is a family that promotes many aspects of arrogance. And the evil family produces children who are vessels of dishonor. And all we need in this country is one generation of vessels of dishonor and it can destroy us. Uh, just uh, last week, I believe, there was a football game in Anderson between T.L. Hanna and Westside. After the football game, some thugs went out and shot up the Applebee's Right out there, I guess it's 28. Is that where? Clemson Boulevard, right out there. So it's a, a popular boulevard, and it's got a lot of restaurants, and it's, uh, it's not really a poor area. And they just shot up the Applebee's. I don't know if they hit anybody. I think they did. And I don't think anybody died, though. I'm not sure. But that's, that's a vessel of dishonor. And uh, that shows no uh, compassion, definitely, and no consideration for others. Complete and total lack of of humility. And when we have vessels of dishonor running around, shooting up places, and acting like nuts, it's going to hurt our country. Now, the home of the righteous, as mentioned in Psalms, or was it Proverbs? Proverbs 3, 33 through 35. The, um, the righteous, the home of the righteous here, is the family that lives under the laws of divine establishment. And that could include unbelievers. And there are unbelievers who obey their parents, who love their country, who join the military, and they live honorable lives. These are vessels of honor because they function under humility, because they function under the divine laws of establishment. And that's for the unbeliever. For the believer, uh, we must orient to God's plan for whatever dispensation you live in, in our case, the church age. So the home of the righteous is the family under the laws of divine establishment or the family of believers living under God's plan for that dispensation. And Proverbs 3, 33 through 35 is actually uh, talking about both believer and unbeliever. Now, in uh, James 4, 5 through 6, it quotes this passage. 
But in James, it uh, only applies to believers. So in James chapter 4, 5 through 6, it says this, Or do you presume that the Scripture speaks in vain against jealousy? Uh, jealousy is part of arrogance, of course, not part of humility. The Spirit who dwells in us pursues us with love, and He gives us more grace. Therefore, it says, what says Proverbs 3.34? It says, God makes war against the arrogant, but He gives grace to the humble. In the context of Proverbs, the arrogant refers to the believer or unbeliever who is anti-establishment or anti-authority. But in the context of James, it refers only to the believer. And it really brings it home for us as believers that humility is mandated and very necessary. Not only to have humility under the laws of divine establishment, but also, most importantly for us, to have a humility with regards to getting with the, un the unique spiritual life. 1 Peter chapter 5, 5 through 6 uh, describes an aspect of having humility and also makes reference to Proverbs. That's 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6, and you can turn there if you wish. If you don't wish, don't worry about it. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6. I'll let you turn there because I wanted to take a drink. 1 Peter 5, 5 through 6. Likewise, you younger men, be subject to your elders. Now, younger men does not refer to um, youth, and elders does not refer to being old. Elders refers to pastors. That's the, the way they've always uh, done it. So you must be under the authority of your pastors, what it's saying. And the uh, younger men are simply the men in the congregation under the pastor. And this is understood in military life because uh, you could have a commander who is uh, 24, and, uh, they, and all the people under his authority affectionately call him old man. But he ain't old. He's 24. He's a young man. Uh, but the elders refers to a person in authority, and then in this case, pastors. In fact, all of you, that is, all of you in the congregation, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. This refers to having grace orientation, having humility and grace thinking. And when you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, it means you're not eager to gossip malign and judge others who are in the congregation. And uh, as I've said, we all have sin natures, and uh, therefore... Uh, our sins are no one else's business, and that's just the way it is, and it makes it a comfortable setting where people who have sin natures, and all of us do, can learn the Word of God. Then he goes on, For God makes war against the arrogant, but He gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves, that is, to become grace-oriented, under the powerful hand of God. And that would be to learn Bible doctrine. That is the powerful hand of God. It's, in fact, sharper than any two-edged sword. That He may promote you at the proper time. And that's dealing with the spiritual promotion. Now, a lot of times in the early church and around here, they got into competition with each other. Who is the greatest believer, etc. And this promotion is actually dealing with a spiritual promotion. And they were eager to know who would be greatest in the kingdom of heaven, as we saw in Matthew. Who's going to be the greatest? Well, who cares? Just live your own spiritual life. Live and let live, and uh, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all things will work out, and all these things will be added to you. In uh, Romans 8, 28, everything will work out if you love uh, God the Father, etc. So don't uh, get in competition. Christianity is not designed for competition. Now, to clothe or fasten yourselves to each other is the Greek way of expressing interaction. And this means that your interaction with others in the congregation should be one of grace. Your interaction with people in the congregation, and uh, interaction is inevitable among people who sit together in one congregation, uh, but your uh, speech, your interaction with each other should be free from gossip, maligning, judging. It should be free from competition and all of those other disgusting aspects of arrogance. And that is how you clothe yourselves or fasten yourselves to each other. It's just the Greek way of expressing interaction or uh, common uh, talk uh, uh, conversation. 
If God doesn't promote you, you're not promoted. And that's the principle that we get out of the last part of the verse. If God doesn't promote you, you are not promoted. You can only be promoted through your residence, your function, inside the unique spiritual life. And the principle is that achievement belongs to God. Achievement belongs to God. Or what you achieve in this spiritual life, it all belongs to God. And uh, that's because you achieve it in grace. You wouldn't be able to achieve it apart from the grace of God. So it belongs to God. But happiness belongs to the believer. When you, uh, as it were, achieve in the spiritual life, it belongs to God. When you grow in grace and knowledge, all of that belongs to God. But as a result of that, there's a, a blessing that comes out of it, and that's happiness. And that happiness belongs to you. And that's a, a wonderful thing. Now, I'm going to cut it short today because I'm going to have a, a busy day tomorrow. And uh, I think I'll probably head to Gaffney tonight. My dad's going to have uh, eye surgery, so he might be blind for a while. I don't know. I think he might be able to see after surgery after about two hours. If that's the case, I'll have class tomorrow. But if he's blind, I'm not going to leave him there. And uh, so class will be canceled. Uh, but I'm pretty sure I'll call all of you or somebody will call you for sure and let you know if class will be on tomorrow or not. I expect it will be, but uh, depending on the circumstances, it may not. And uh, he's going to have uh, surgery and, uh, to fix his uh, old age eye problem. And then uh, next week, I believe, it seems like next week I'll be moving uh, from where I am now. I don't think I'll have to cancel because of that, but we'll have to wait and see. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, uh, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us the, to these things, and uh, may we grow in grace and in knowledge so that we can become the great levy system for our country to keep us from the uh, coming storms of the cycles of discipline. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.